<laughs> well, so so we uh, we landed in Athens and we stayed at some of these houses. Tell everybody what you're telling us. This is the story about me, the Father of Fears. I was oh. I was a newly ordained priest in 1988 and uh, landed in Athens and uh, we stayed with somebody and and the lady after the second day she says. Uh, why don't we go meet Father Porfirius? I said, who's Father Porfirius? He says, oh, you would like him. Let's just go. So we, we ended up in uh, Oroboso, where he's, the new buildings were, the recent buildings. Uh, he was 92 at the time. He was yeah. very late, very late in his life, and, and he was very sick. So we arrived there. The building wasn't quite finished, and uh, he was in one of those rooms in there. But they wouldn't let us in because he had just come back from the hospital. He was very sick. So the lady that took us there begged them to let us go in because this priest came from America with his wife and he will never have another chance to meet the Yeronda, so please you know, tell him that we're here. So he gave the permission and we went up. Uh, just to give you a little background, my wife's father was in the military and he went two tours in Vietnam and he, he suffered from post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. stress or whatever they call it. And, and uh, he, he was a, kind of a difficult person. And that was part of our life, you know, in experiencing him. And, and anyway, so, so we go up. Now, we've never been there. We've never seen, of course, Father Porfirius. He doesn't know who we are. He was just told that we came from America. So I go up, and he's in a little room, unfinished room, on a little bed, lying down. He's blind, basically. And um, I go up. I greet him. I kiss his hand. He says, where's your wife? And I said, she's right behind me. So she comes closer. And he reaches out, and he just hits her on the face. Oh. And she starts crying. She, she, she steps back a little bit. Uh, and he starts telling us, describing her father, his psychology, his personality, to the T, as if he had gone for psychoanalysis to him. Okay? Such is a clear description of who her father was, precisely. And then he finishes with the father and starts with the mother precisely exactly how the mother is, finishes with the mother, starts with the, the, her sister, and then goes to the other sister and describes all four people in her family with every detail of their psycho, whatever, what their situation was psychologically. But why did he slap her? Well, I we found out he slaps all the women. I think he has no depth perception. <laughs> huh? he used I think he has no depth perception. That's just my idea. That's your idea. <laughs> your, what was your idea? He slapped no all the women. Perception. Oh, maybe he was doing it... Uh, Out of love. In a loving way. No, in a loving yeah. way, yeah. Was it a hard slap or a... No, it was just light, but, you know, she had... She didn't expect it, so she kind of... Oh, well, when you that. first told it, I, I thought it was like, you know... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it was, uh, well, it was, it was <laughs> too hard for her because she started crying. Yeah. Uh, oh. And then after he finished everything, you know, after telling us all of that, he, uh, he turns to me and he says, and take good care of her. She's very sensitive. <laughs> 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 and I was ready to say to him, you just slapped her in the face. <laughs> Did she get over it? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She... she you know, I mean, she stopped crying eventually, and she was surprised by what he said. Yeah. She was so surprised by what he was telling her. Stunning. Yeah, that, that, you know, she But when crying. he described him, the family, what was his point in that? I have no idea. His point was, well, we asked him a question, yeah. and I think he was trying to tell us that some of her problems, whatever it is, mm -hmm. come from her family. Yes. Okay? And that was the, the point of, uh, of telling us who the family was. Wow. But where did he get all of that? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> Intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is. Uh. Uh, I'm not sure that's a story I want to pass along or not. No. <laughs> that's why we're meeting a priest. <laughs> that's, <here. laughs> that's, that's a priest story. Oh, you didn't tell that story before. Didn't you have another story that was... I thought you had a nice story about him. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't exactly... This was the story. I mean, I, I never saw him after that. That was it. I mean, we spent about 20 minutes with him, and then uh, we left. He, he used to do that to visitors, start telling them stories about their life. Yeah. Yeah, he was like an open book. Yeah. Uh, and I met Father the Basius too, up on the mountain. Yeah. Perhaps a little before you did, because you went in 88? Yeah, I saw him the year before he died. Okay, no, that's late. I met him in 86. Okay. Mm. Are we supposed to ask questions? Yeah, or just uh -huh. chat, or whatever, you, whatever you want to share. Is, I'm impressed with your writing style. You say a lot with a small amount of words, and I'm just wondering, do you do all your editing, or does your wife help, or others? Because your speaking style is uh, a little bit in contrast.
class with your writing style? How do you know how you were able to do that? Perhaps as a professor? Or? Um, well, my wife does editing and get, gets me feedback. And uh, it, it went through several uh, editing uh, people, friends of mine, like Mike Lewis, for example, that I have conversations with. Uh, then I give it to my son for uh, any linguistic kind of roughness mm -hmm. because he's, uh, he's a literary person. And the, the traditional uh, editing that comes from the publisher. So what, what I've only read The Mountain of Silence, but it's just, you, it's a unique talent. The, the book is filled with good content, but the writing style is just a pleasure to read. And most times today, you don't see that in a lot of literary things you read. And that's why I didn't know what process you used to get that, but I'm along. Well, I, um, when I first started working, uh, in this area. My earlier books were traditional academic. I wrote two books before I started this. And it's the, the kind of ordinary kind of a textbook. Uh, not textbook, but a, a book that an academic would write. But then when I started meeting these unusual people, how do you study them? What, uh, if you raise the, the traditional academic questions, you lose all this richness. So uh, a friend of mine, the wife of a colleague of mine said, uh, as I was reflecting, what, how do I study this thing? You know, why don't you keep a journal and record down whatever you, uh, you witness, whatever you hear? And whenever I am, for example, with Father Maximus, I will take notes, but at the same time, I will never lose an opportunity from taking him on tape. Yeah. And then I will take all that material and then work them within the context of my my own craftsmanship, let's put it this way. It is an art, and I think you have definite opening, and we have a lot of meat in the middle, and always you end, you end in the chapel for vespers, at least in the Mount of Silence, or something, and you bring us back into the world. And that lot, one of the books you recommended on Gabriella, or yeah. 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 something of love, or whatever, and there you, and you stayed up while they were praying. I remember you said you wanted to fall asleep reading that. I just thought, you know, you not only illustrated what Father Maximus said, but you practiced it without realizing it. Mm. But you, you captured it. And then I started thinking, I wonder how much you received that we will never know because you do have such a nice compact style. Well, thank you. I, um, it's the style that I discover is very accessible to readers. I wish I had that. And, I, I and, that and, and you bring in stories, and then you bring in some of the more heavy stuff but then you have to bring back the story so yeah. that uh, it's light yeah. and explain it, it. it lightens the heaviness of the material. And in my talk, I mean, all right, I, I gave uh, some story to no, catch. We enjoyed the talk because your yeah. talk, you actually weaved one story into another mm -hmm. and sometimes I go, hey, we finished that, but now we're over here. It's not a bad thing. I'm just saying your writing style is what intrigues me because that's mm. what I think a lot of us. Well, with, with writing, you have to consciously uh, think how to write the chapter. But when you are talking, things come out more uh, spontaneously. Yes? Three things. I'm not in the priest circle, but can I ask? <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> in the circle. I'm not a priest either. Yeah, so well, much for that. I had other things to do. I do, yes. Yeah. yes but yeah, so Christine is busy, so it's all right. Um, I would love to see a map in your books, and you probably do that on purpose, because you say we went to this village and it's over the mountains. And I don't, I mean, outside of the rough Cyprus, being with, uh, and I'm aware of the northern two thirds being taken over. I just can't make a connection where the monasteries are. And you might do that for a reason. I mean, you may not want people it's to... trying to hide the <coughs> Exactly. Right. I, mean, I, I understand that there might be done for conscious reasons, so people don't, like me, don't go to Cyprus and start yeah. tracking around. That, that's number one. Number two, I would like to let the reader uh, create in his or her own mind the setting. Mm. Which works. You, you give them some, uh, some material, and then they can create their own scenarios, how they see it. Second, do you save all the tapes? Yes. You do, great. And third, does Father Maximus and 
understand what a rock star he's turning into. <laughs> <laughs> he came here and he got a little uh, taste, taste of that at the Holy Cross. Well, I brought a group, Canadian group, to Cyprus. And we went up to the monastery and I arranged and he came up from the Missos and we met. And he spent over an hour and a half with them. Really? Oh, yeah. I took pictures with him. And he, right. uh, he enjoyed that too. All right. They, they asked him questions, had a conversation, you know, spiritual life. And they had all read the book. First one. Ah, uh, okay. So. This was in 2004, I think. Yeah, the, the books that com came out in Greek, before I, I make a stipulation with the publisher that once it is translated, I want him to read it and make sure that things are accurate in terms of the translation and, and that's very helpful. So the, the Greek publications, uh, are really an improvement over the actual conversations because of the, um, and he, uh, he, he really liked that. He liked the oh. books? Mm, he likes them, yeah. And he, sometimes he would take things out that he feels would create unnecessary trouble. For example, I have a critical comment about the former archbishop. And mm -hmm. uh, why do you want to start unnecessary? But for the, an English-American audience, uh, that is more, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also, I want to tell you that when we met him in 2004, he asked me, he says, do you like Kiev's books? Book, I guess, it was on yeah. the yeah. I said, yes, I do. He says, is it worth translating into, into Greek? <laughs> of course, I said, of course. So, <laughs> you have to give me a copy of that one. All right. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, Doctor. Um, you know, we, we've heard about your spiritual journey and how you uh, went from, like you said, from agnostic to... Uh, that was the big conversion, from, from really doubting everything right. to... Yeah. So that was the big step you told us about yeah. how that, that came about. So with, uh, with the amount of people that we have that are cradle orthodox who... May not be, may not have been in your particular situation, but have different scenarios where they're really not have not become close to the church. What do you think would be? Uh, how how should we approach them? What would be the best way to get them interested? Is it through only intellectual or reading, or how, how can we get pull them in the doors? What, what would it take? That's a tough question. I know, and it will <laughs> depend on the individual. Yeah, some individuals, if they are of the intellectual types, mm -hmm. you can approach them on their level of where they are at. Okay. If they are more of the emotional type, then uh, the approach will be different. But most of conversions take place after people became friends with somebody okay. who is so into the, the church. Interpersonal relationships. The interpersonal relations come first. The theological commitment comes last. Okay. Uh, very few people become, uh, they have the road to Damascus kind of experience. But I think Father Paul is talking about the Orthodox who are the Orthodox and they are taking the church for granted and we have plenty of them. Uh, I think that the, the book, the first one, and, and the, other, the other ones I suppose too, but, but especially the first one, and, and I know from the people that I had in my parish here, and of course down in Florida also, the same thing, same experience. When I did the spiritual book club and I went over the book, uh, I had one particular person here in, uh, in this parish who, who came up to me and says, I have been Orthodox for 45 years, I have served at different levels in the church. This is the first time I realized that the Orthodox Church has this dimension, mm. the mm. mystical mm. dimension. Mm. Okay, and I think that's what at least Mountain of Silence brings out very clearly okay. for somebody who has never experienced the monasteries, the, the spiritual fathers, the yeah. you know the Gerondes that the, well, you know we take for granted in Greece and in Cyprus because they're always there. We run to the monastery every time we we need spiritual nourishment. But somebody here. Right. They have to get in the plane and go across the country to find a monastery or... I mean, you know, the uniqueness, the uniqueness here was anything. that if, if a priest or a theologian wrote a book like this, you know, I don't think it would be embraced the way it is. Yeah, because, yeah probably. Uh, again, I think uh, the layperson's perspective and journey is much different. Yeah. And, uh, Speaking about how to bring people in, uh, the approach is very important. Not to think that you are trying to force them into a door that they cannot go through. Um, I, I mentioned that towards the end of Inner River. When I went back after I finished my research, I, I got a, an email 
from somebody, a Jewish fellow who was a librarian in one of the Jewish universities or colleges in New York City. He read The Mountain of Silence and loved it, he said. And he, but he said, you know, I have a problem. I am Jewish. How can I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me? <laughs> so what do you do? Do you tell him you have to convert? No, you don't tell him to convert. I said to him, well, I, I recognize your, uh, your, your, uh, your problem, of course. It's, uh, it's a serious problem. But how about if you use um, uh, St. Gregory Palamas' version of the prayer, who would say, Lord, enlighten my darkness. Lord, and So I sent the email. After a uh, couple, three weeks, he raised me, oh, thank you so much. I have never been blessed so much. Um, once I, I got that prayer and I started it, I feel a different person. After that, leave it to God. I mean, mm -hmm. What can you do? Yeah. Uh, if it's his time to uh, see certain things, fine. And even if not, the man is helped. And given the fact that goes inside him, leave the rest to God. Yeah, that's good. And we shouldn't really expect that the whole world has to be converted into orthodoxy because it's not a realistic expectation. No. What we can do is that, uh, preserve this tradition and make it available for people who can connect with it. And that way, the world becomes a little bit better. See, there was a man today that came. Uh, I'm not sure you know, how he got interested to come. Maybe he read the book or something. An older gentleman. And, he's, and uh, I had a little conversation with him in the hallway. And he says, well, you know, I'm much more nationalistic in Greek than I am Orthodox <laughs> or Christian. He says, I am a Christian, but he you know, realized that. He was proud of that. When he said that, he oh, was proud oh, very, of that. Oh, very, very. I mean, he, he told me. He, I mean, I'm he said he was real. He was a real person. Like, he was standing close. He says, I'm a real person. And what real to him meant is that he's nationalistic yeah. rather than religious. Well, he said it means more to him. How, yeah. how is that different from I am an American? And Americanism right. and Christianity somehow right. got together, and they corrupted each other hmm. in the process. <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your third book about, since we just got it? Is In the River? Yeah. Well, you know, I, what, is that yes, what it's called? Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I can tell you what the chapters are. Give it to me. Part of, part of it is the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit is part of it. But he'll tell yeah, uh, okay. The first chapter deals with reminiscences, and that's uh, reflecting about growing old with a colleague of mine on the coast of Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that um, uh, I, I've been thinking about. Some of that I talked about in my talk uh, in, in the morning. The second chapter, I call it Athos in America. And that is when Father Maximus came to the US uh, through the invitation of people in Boston uh, to be the keynote speaker of a conference on healing and uh, Byzantium. And I was going to be his simultaneous translator. So I describe the, um, I describe the encounter with Father Maximus coming to America, Athos in America. And uh, with the kind of questions that the seminarians asked him after he he did his presentation. So that takes the first Athos in America. Then we go out for dinner and we begin conversing about various issues, which I call symposium, which was in, a, um, in an Afghanistani restaurant in Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was Lent, and that was the only place where they had vegetarian, uh, vegetarian <laughs> food. <laughs> So there is a, the beginning of a discussion around the uh, St. Paul's uh, gifts of the Spirit. What are the gifts of the Spirit? And he enumerates several of them. So we begin discussing that, and that's one chapter. Then the second chapter, Fruits of the Spirit, the continuation of that dialogue around that issue. The third real piece uh, is this... Uh, but we do not complete it because 
there is one uh, gift that we didn't have the time to finish called the gift of love. Mm. So I leave this for a later conversation, <laughs> later <laughs> discussion. Then the landscape shifts to Cyprus. I call it foggy landscapes. We go there, Father Maximus is on a trip somewhere in Greece. So it's hot and I describe my encounter with this communist, uh, former communist uh, member of the, of the party there, uh, a writer who has this existential yes, uh, um, what do you say? Mean to, who is, to it, who is his that? His yeah. name? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Afisto Serafim. Afisto Serafim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the writer. Yeah. Um, Panikos Peonidis. But I didn't, I gave him I a different know. name. I, I call him Vladimiros because you of the right. I, I talked about him. About. So this is my discussion with him about uh, why it doesn't make sense to be a believer in the five senses and becoming zero when you die. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of uh, a chapter that deals with the fundamental questions of life and death uh, in a way to alleviate the anxiety of this 85-year-old brilliant man, but who had the wrong understanding of reality, I thought. So it, it gave me, he gave me the opportunity to, uh, to engage in this kind of conversation. Then the, the next chapter, Beyond Death, is when I go to Father Maximus and I tell him what, I, what we discussed with, the, with, with this uh, writer. And then I, I make a passing comment that uh, the only thing we can know in life is that we will die and we'll never know when we will die. And then Father Maximus uh, said, uh, the, fir the first is true that we will die, the second is not necessarily so. I said, what do you mean? And then all three of us who were there sat down to hear what he had to say. And then he started describing us elders on Mount Athos who uh, knew exactly when they were uh, about to die. Yeah. And uh, I, I make a little chapter out of these uh, conversations. Then pil pilgrimage, um, it's a pilgrimage to Mount Athos, the next chapter, with my friend Andonis again. We go to a couple of monasteries. And that gives me an opportunity to, to talk about things that I didn't cover in the other books, uh, such as, for example, the history of Christianity and how sociologists view it. Because my friend kept asking me questions about the history of of Christianity, and that gave me the opportunity to elaborate on how Christianity from a, an unknown um, cult in the Middle East became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and how from 100 people uh, that were at the time of um, uh, the beginning of Christianity became 6 million by the time when Constantine made him the official religion. So that gave me an opportunity to, uh, to bring in the the contributions of sociology <coughs> in understanding the history of, of Christianity That's a good through, through a conversation. Did you read it again? Read book? No, but I read another book which is dealing with that. Uh, I use I I used conventional sociological material from authors that are established. They are very convincing how Christianity developed. Then monastic hospitality. Uh, yeah, it's a pilgrimage, and monastic hospitality is about Mount Athos. And with the, then mysteries of Sinai. We come back, we have a little conversation with Father Maximus, and then I take off with five women to the desert of Egypt. Mm. Uh, and there are some humorous kind of encounter. My wife and her and some of her friends. So I thought their husbands were going to come, and here I am, the only man <laughs> with five women. We go to Cairo. And a shopkeeper said, your wives? <laughs> <laughs> and you said yes. <laughs> I can't afford all of them. One of it. So that, um, that gives me an opportunity to say a few things about Islamic Christianity and, uh, and the monastery there, the founding monastery. In the river, uh, we go to Mesopotamos, the name Mesopotamos. of the book in Greek is Mesa or Mesopotamos, mm -hmm. which is both in the river, oh, but it's true. also a location in Cyprus. 
where Father Maximus created a uh, restored an ancient monastery uh, that was a ruin, and then some rich man uh, on the island gave him something like 4,000 euros and rebuilt the monastery. So it has now, he took some of the monks from uh, Mahiraj. Is Bishop Nicola still there? Or is bishop Nicola is bishop now yeah, in Limassol. Oh, so it's uh, somebody else, the, the abbot. So we go there, and my friend Stephanos and others come, and I open the conversation to finish the gift of the desert. Uh, the, the gifts of the spirit that uh, St. Paul was talking yeah, about. And amazing. there is a beautiful chapter about love, mm -hmm. the meaning of love that Father Maximus elaborates. And I, ended up, I end up the chapter by uh, reading uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the epistle of Paul love. on love, which I think is the most extraordinary mm -hmm. literary piece on love anywhere in the history of the world. And that's how I finish the, the chapter there. But I, I do it in the context of my own personal experiences and my relationship. Then a Hermes Joy is the story I told you, but in greater. The river of the Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Or Mesopotamia. What do you plan on next? Or I how, do you, no how are you looking? I am reading and I am experiencing. If, if God wants me to write another book, I'll do it. <laughs> but I'll keep notes, hopefully in the same style. All of these are based on personal experiences and uh, intellectual uh, reflection. Do you have any advice for priests? Advice for a priest? For all of us, for just in general. Keep doing what you are doing <laughs> and leave the rest to God. <laughs> and, uh, what if, um, I, I, I think you, are, you have a fantastic church here, speaking about really, the, really um, Yeah, I've seen your church here, but and, and we went to see what uh, Father uh, Jacob is doing with all his you see, relics. He doesn't have any relics there. I'm so sorry. No. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was in, uh, in Kentucky to the ACO uh, church there. The uh, ACO. Uh, OCA. OCA. OCA, sorry. ACO, that's it. <laughs> and it's a fantastically vibrant church. I mean, there's a lot of people there and very devout. In Nicholsville? Uh, no, in um, Louisville. Oh, Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so, um, what advice? Hmm. I mean, just from your experiences that you've seen, or maybe from, uh, you know, during that difficult time period, was there anything else the church or the priest should have been doing better or something we well, should be I, doing I, to try I, to think, um, I think one of the things that uh, alienates the younger generation, right? So Greek Orthodox, they grow yes, up in the yes, church and so yes. on. Then they go to the university, and then they are exposed to the secular culture there. And because they were not being prepared, in what way? that out there there are good people and it's not just us who are the good ones and everybody else who is in ignorance and stupidity because they go out and they see nice people and they said i mean these people are uh, in the dark ages and therefore there is this cognitive dissonance in this shock and they if they become interested in spirituality they create something of their own they go to buddhism they go to hinduism because they define the orthodox church as backward and medieval, unfortunately. Hmm. So, or old fashioned. Or so, therefore, or developing a more um, pluralistic kind of uh, educational preparation will make them less vulnerable to reject the, t the church. In other words, they will be more, um, they will develop immunities, let's put it this way. Uh, speaking from my own experience, sure, sure. but I was I was lucky because I, I met the people that I met, mm -hmm. and not everybody has these uh, encounters. They have different encounters. So um, I, I would say, um, I instead of saying that we have all the truth and everybody else is in the dark, our truth leads us to God. Beyond that, we cannot make any statements because we leave the rest to God. What else can you say? As it, go ahead. I, I was just saying that, that's an interesting topic with me because you know, I run into this all the time with younger people. And 
it's like you said, that, you know, youth is a natural time of rebelliousness anyway. I mean, I, I certainly was when I was back then. And they come to the church and it, and it seems, like you say, staid and traditional and maybe a little old fashioned, this kind of thing. And it may keep them away. But at the same time, some of those same kids I have seen after they get married, they get to their late 20s, early 30s, all of a sudden, those same qualities have more of an appeal to them. They're yes. thirsty for them, actually. Yeah. They're because they're, them. they get a little tired of all the rebelliousness and the uncertainty and, say, and things like that, and they're looking for something that is more solid. And I think it's hard for, particularly the Orthodox Church, to, to maintain that, that middle road, so to speak, so that you're accommodating enough to the needs of children coming, coming up, but at the same time, you know, you're not just so fly by night in, in nature that once they get there and they, they need a, a greater sense of groundedness that they don't feel like they Yeah, I, I think uh, more, uh, the best thing we can do is become mothers, in other words, through action. They, if they see you that you are doing without condemning, mm -hmm. without being austere, mm -hmm. um, they will be attracted, they will be attracted. Well, what do you think? I mean, this is great, um, it follows up this question. And one thing I was really impressed by, a lot of what you were, you, uh, as you were sharing, and you really were able to bridge, be a bridge between, you know, people who are academic, showing them how to, you know, how, how to, you know, you don't relate to those people the same way you relate to other people, you know, learning how to actually find common ground between people. Yes. And I think, you know, one of the things that I find in my friends they like orthodoxy when they hear about it, but they don't want to, they don't ever think about it because, like, I thought that was just for Greeks. I thought that was just for Russians. Ah. You know, so if you, your, your role as a sociologist, I'm curious what your thoughts are, you know, as we want to reach out to this, to this nation, what role should, you know, our, what, how, what, what's the proper place for our, you know, national, our ethnicities to enter into the, into the faith as we embrace role here that's more missionary oriented. Or the idea even that the reality, once they, they've read and they, yeah. they get all excited, then they come to the reality of church life. That is, I mean, for the first yeah. time, and I'm not talking about my books, but we have at our disposal very beautiful books that can appeal to anybody from any religion for that matter. And I'm talking about Elder Porfirio's uh, Wounded by Love or Eltres Gavrilia, the ascetics of love. All, all of these things are very, very beautiful books that are not doctrinaire, but rather they express the open-heartedness of the saint. And there are this kind of bibliotherapy that one can do. But one thing that we need to understand is the environment within which we, we operate. Uh, the United States was built by basically Protestant migrants from, from Europe. They came here and they established the fundamental framework of the society. Uh, the framers of the Constitution, they may not have been mainstream Protestants, but their culture was Protestant and they brought it. And within that context, they, the modern American democratic system was created. And the basic principles of democracy is that no one individual or group has the whole truth but rather the truth is the, pro the product of democratic voting. debate, <laughs> voting, and now, very Masonic. well, whatever it is, that's how uh, democracy functioned in ancient Athens among those who were members of the, of the, of the city, and that's, uh, that's how democracy is understood. We have a, um, th the disadvantage of coming to the United States very late in the development of the country. The, the Catholics came, so they were able to establish themselves in spite of all the prejudices and so on. Mm -hmm. But they play a much more active role. They have played they in have bigger numbers. Bigger yeah. numbers. We are a minority. Another, another problem that we may have uh, is that it is the Greek Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox Church. The notion of orthodoxy itself uh, may sound problematic in the ears of people, in the sense that, what do you mean orthodox? Mm -hmm. Right dogma. Well, dogmatism in an academic setting 
is considered to be narrow-mindedness. That's how reflectively they, they respond. Quite often when I'm, I'm speaking to academic audience, I avoid using the word orthodox. I say Eastern Christianity. And I talk about Eastern Christianity as preserving the, uh, the mystical traditions. If I have in the audience people who are into Hinduism and Buddhism, I said, there is uh, a Tibetan Christianity that we have not really addressed. And I talk about Mount Athos. Mm. Uh, I won't talk in that language in Orthodox because they will misunderstand it. But within that framework, they say, really? You mean there is this and that? And we thought that Christianity is Billy Graham and, uh, mm. and uh, the Pope and so on. So they see a different face of Christianity uh, that is willing to have a dialogue with people who come from different traditions without giving any labels because that violates the spirit of Christ in terms of loving everybody and accepting everybody. So we need to bring, I think, this early spirit of Christianity of relating to, I don't know if, if I can say that, because at the early stages of Christianity, they had to become different from the Gentiles and the others, because the Gentiles were into paganism and the 12 gods and so on. But today, you cannot go and say that I have the truth and everybody else in the dark. They will, uh, they will turn it somewhere else. They will say, this is not authentic, because it is not... Uh, it seems haughty. It seems, it seems um, uh, ethnocentric. That's how they will interpret it. So, I mean, I don't want to be anywhere else that I found orthodoxy because it's, it's compatible with my own upbringing and background and culture. But I can't expect somebody who grew up a Hindu to all of a sudden become converted into orthodoxy because it's more true than, than Hinduism. You know, somebody went to, I am told about that from, uh, what's his name? Remember, he made a big uh, album of photographs that he has made uh, has, uh, oh, from Mount Athos for 30 years. Um, I met him uh, in Arizona, Douglas uh, is his name. Uh, he knew uh, Father Emilianos of Simon uh, Eventually, he, um, he converted, he became Orthodox. But somebody told him, a, um, an American or a Westerner went to Maharishi Yogi. Remember Maharishi Yogi? Mm -hmm. He said, I want to become a Hindu um, and really go deep into Hinduism. But why do you want to become a Hindu? He said, you are not a Hindu, you are a Westerner. And he said, well, what does that mean? You have, you have something that is part of your own tradition. Why don't you go to Mount Athos? Mm -hmm. why, why become Hindu? Because you are, you are not a Hindu. You are not born a Hindu. Go to Mount Athos. He did go to Mount Athos, and I think he became Orthodox. Hmm. And I'm not sure whether he stayed there as a monk, but uh, it was Maharishi who told him that. Hmm. I would like to see somebody, I think the Patriarch of Constantinople deserves more, uh, uh, more widespread um, credit. credit than he gets, hmm. because he's somebody who can really be on the level of the Dalai Lama and the others who come to America and all the media are, are after them. Because I think the patriarch has this broad mindedness and the fact that he started these uh, ecological get togethers every year and they go to different places and he, I, I saw it a, a, a video where he allowed himself to be blessed by native uh, people in Brazil uh, when he went there to, um, and he brings people from all the religions to reflect and discuss issues related to ecology and also scientists. So he's really struggling to bring together the, the best of the religions and the best of science to save the environment. And he uses his orthodox tradition to do that. So when the Dalai Lama comes to New York, I mean, he's a hero. Uh, and Hollywood is won over by the Dalai Lama. Uh, now, why does he do that? What, uh, just to give you an example, I was talking to a psychiatrist in, at Harvard. 
he was telling me what happened when the New York Academy of Science invited the Dalai Lama to speak to the scientists. And the majority of them felt uncomfortable. What is this strange guy from the East coming to speak to the scientists? So, you know, you've seen the Dalai Lama on television. He came there and uh, he started praising Western science in his talk, how much we can learn from you. Uh, in the West, you have expanded you, uh, our awareness of the, of the vastness of the universe and so on. But we in Tibet, he said, we spend our time uh, exploring inner space. And maybe we can make an exchange. You can teach us about mm. the outer space, and we can teach you something about inner space. He won them over. He won them over because he didn't tell them you are all in the dark, right. but rather that right. like, we are so great. Mm -hmm. That was the attitude of St. Paul when he went to the Athenians. This is what Callistor's Ware told me. He didn't go there condemning the Greeks, the Greek philosophers that you are in the dark and this and that. He, he praised them about how much they have advanced in terms of and then he brought them, he took them further. Took them further. So we have the models right there. Mm. But, but co coming to the question of uh, youth, and I don't remember how the question was posed, I think that uh, we have a problem because we are unable to convey to our own people what the church has, that inner exploration ability. We are unable to do it in our parishes today. The how are we going to give it to the rest of the world? The only way is to become our self examples. Okay. The, well, the that's same, our problem. The, the same thing. Um, <laughs> that's our how I, I was that's asked uh, to write um, a chapter in a, of a book that is coming out by the Holy Cross uh, Orthodoxy in Academia. Mm. Who's writing that? I, I wrote it. It's going to come out in 2013. And various people wrote academics. Oh, it's a, you're the uh, editor? Huh? You're the editor? You're oh, no, I'm not the editor. I am a contributor. Contributor. Uh, um, I think that it is coming next year. What's your chapter? On uh, sociology, Eastern Orthodoxy and uh, academia. Yeah. And um, I, I, I wrote about how um, it depends what your audience is. I also was asked by the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology to write an article mm. about this. And I started it by saying that transpersonal psychology developed in the late 60s by psychologists who were fed up with materialism. And where did they go to find answers? They went to Tibet and to Hinduism. Uh, Maslow, um, with his um, further reaches of human nature, they started the a journal of Transpersonal Psychology and the Society for Tra Transpersonal Studies in California. But there was no, the, the leading thinkers were, are people who are in, the, in academia, but they got their inspiration from, uh, from Hinduism and Buddhism. So what I was writing in that article, I tried to point that out, that uh, the Christianity also has a lot to offer to Transpersonal Psychology, and here is the how to go about. And uh, it, it got published <coughs> a couple of years ago, three years ago. What was uh, the article called? Uh, um, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity and Transpersonal Theory. Theory? Transpersonal Theory, yeah. And uh, I... Um, I brought that out that uh, what people have been looking in Tibet and in Buddhism and in the New Age, yeah, they can find it in Orthodoxy. That's the first step. If you tell them that th all of these people are all wrong and they, they are not going to bother with you. They are not going to look. Uh, they are not going to be bothered. In the article that I wrote for the uh, uh, Holy Cross, I, I ended it by saying that in the final analysis, the the way to spread orthodoxy is to become ourselves an embodiment mm -hmm. of that tradition. Mm -hmm. That's how Christianity expanded during its early stages. When the plagues came into the Roman Empire, uh, the pagans uh, didn't uh, take care of them, of each other. They ran away. Hmm? They ran away. They ran away. 
And Christians were taking care not only of each other, but also their pagan neighbors. Because that's what Christ told them to do. So what happened? Well, pagans were very impressed. Many of them survived because Christians were giving them food and water. Furthermore, Christians developed immunities. So their survival rate was higher than the pagans. And given the way of thinking of the pagans, that you, you, do, you, you pray to the gods, not for salvation of your soul, but to get practical results, well, it means that the, the Christian God is superior to Zeus and the others. So many of them converted because of this. And at the same time, Christians were not into abortion and uh, infanticides. The ancient uh, Greeks and Romans, they didn't think of anything about exposing a little baby. Uh, we have it in Oedipus Rex. Mm. And uh, in the Roman period, there was a it was time. Legal. Hmm? It was legal. It was legal, yeah. In the fact, there is a letter of some husband who was serving as a Roman soldier telling his wife, if it's a girl, just expose it. Mm. So what happened, because of patriarchy, girls were, uh, were being destroyed mm. as uh, the sewers of Rome were full of the bones of, uh, of little babies, uh, of female babies, whereas there was a plethora of men. So here is an imbalance in the pagan community of more men than women that they could marry. Who would they marry? Well, the Christians had a lot of women because they were not uh, killing their babies. And, a lot of intermarriage, so. and there was a lot of intermarriage and the women, the wives were converting their husbands into Christianity. So that, these are part of the sociological ways. And that they're Christianity having more children. The Christians having more, more children, children because, yeah. So then, really, when Constantine makes the... Oh, you want to have another child, Father? Is that what <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, Sorry. When the, Thank you for the suggestion. Wh sure. <laughs> when, Constantine, when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, uh, it was almost like a, um, uh, a de jure uh, stamp of something that was happening at the grassroots. Hmm. So, in other words, the only thing that we can do, and we, don't, we shouldn't have any fantasies that we're going to change the world, is ourselves becoming the embodiment of the tradition we represent. It's also, I mean, all the stories you've told, the Orthodox of that day, they were, they were out in the community. They were not retreated into Orthodox camps, you know. They were, they were engaged, and not just, you know, think, I think, Orthodox tend to be more protective. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and well, self and inner, inner focus, be it ethnic, ethnically or just or even, even spiritually. And there's not that we, we lack that. I mean, a, lot, a lot of evangelicals who come to the Orthodox Church, which we have a lot of those in, in St. John's, they wonder where is the Orthodox evangelism? And I can point to wonderful things in the past, but in the present, I'm like, this is a challenge for us. You know, the church is very inner focused. You know, so there's some reasons for that. But yeah, but you know, evangelism, it depends. Uh, it's very different from Protestant oh, evangelism. Oh, I know that too. That, yeah, it, it, yeah. It shouldn't be. Take, for example, the Archbishop of Kenya. You know who he is? Uh, Archbishop Makarios? Cypriot, Kenya. Another Cypriot, yeah. <laughs> he is another <laughs> interesting story. He's a uh, oh, yeah. He, and from Limassol, too. <laughs> so he went to Oxford to study music. And he, he loved classical music. Eventually, he ended up studying theology. So he got a, deg a doctoral degree of theology from Oxford. He was a student of Callistos Ware. And one time, he went to see Elder Sofroni. And Elder Sofroni told him, when they ask you to become archbishop, do not say no. Archbishop, he said, I have no intention of becoming an archbishop. <laughs> Because he was interested he was a layman. He, a layman and he wanted to be uh, an academic. <laughs> he wanted to be an academic. <laughs> then Archbishop Macarius of Cyprus, um, uh, he, uh, because in Kenya he was defined as somebody with uh, 
uh, an anti-colonialist leader, and uh, there, were, there was a lot of sympathy in Kenya about the Cypriots. So they called their children Macarius, uh, you know, como Kenyatta no, kind of. Right. Yeah. So he thought that he can start as a, um, a kind of a, um, a seminary because there were uh, an increasing orthodox presence in Kenya. So he asked um, Andreas Dilleridis, that was his name, to go and, uh, and be in charge of the, of, of the theological school there. Well, um, Bishop Macarius uh, tells us that the moment he stepped on, on Kenyan soil, he felt that that's where I would be. He, he felt totally at home there. And when the Archbishop died, everybody voted, you will become the next Archbishop of Kenya. He was still a layman. He was still a layman. Oh. And then he remembered what uh, Saint, uh, I mean, Elder Sofroni told him. <laughs> so he couldn't say no because of that experience he had with him. <laughs> so in four days they make him Archbishop. Wow. The first day they made him deacon. The second day they made him a priest. The third, Archimandrite. The fourth day, Archbishop. <laughs> and he became the Archbishop of Kenya. So, <coughs> huh? yeah, yeah. And, uh, and what, what did he do? He started, uh, I said, do you do any proselytizing? He said, no, we don't do any proselytizing. We just build a church they feed the people. and feed the people. And then we have the our medicine. services. And then people come in to, uh, to, um, to see. And that's how. <laughs> so uh, he baptized a lot of people. Because they come in and voluntarily they want to become Orthodox, but without trying to proselytize them. But he did an inc incredible work. He translated the gospel into the native languages, just like Methodius and Saint Innocent. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the evangelism I'm talking about. Yeah, but without going after them, trying to convert them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not about he the said, we have the service. They hear the chants. They come in, and we offer them food. They come again. But they have a reason to come. Yeah. That it's not so here is a story. <laughs> a a Maasai comes to Bishop uh, Macarius here with his spear. And <laughs> the elders want to see you. Where are the elders? He looked out the window. They were sitting under a tree with their costumes and their spears and their uh, shields. And he goes there. What, what can I do to you? He said, we have a problem. He spoke their language now. We have a problem. And our gods do not have not solved it for us. We want you to pray to your God to solve our problem. <laughs> said, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I, I had to go somewhere. <laughs> so right there, I put my hands up and I said in Greek, Kyrie voitis on dus dulus, or Lord help you. So a, a very short prayer. And then I went my way because he had to, on, on a, G, on a uh, Land Rover that uh, was donated to the, uh, the church there, he had to go and uh, see all his missions all over Kenya. He comes back, tired, goes into his office. The, the Maasai comes back. The elders want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> he goes back to the elders. You are God solved our problem, and we decided that all of us, we want to become Orthodox. <laughs> wow. And they became Orthodox, really? the whole tribe. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what the problem was. Huh? Yeah. I, I don't, he didn't tell us what the problem is. I don't think he even knew what the problem can was. I, can I say something about evangelism? I think that it's really uh, unfair to say that the Orthodox Church does not have evangelization because it's Evan happening ev everywhere. Ev evangelization, yes, but not, um, not proselytization. proselytization. But we have it everywhere. Besides, in Africa, all over the place, of yes, course. Yes. Uh, we don't have it in America trying to get the others to become Orthodox. We don't. But if you go to the... But look how many people have become Orthodox. That's correct. They're becoming Orthodox. Yeah. They're discovering us and they're becoming Orthodox. But we're not actively pursuing them. But, but, but if you go to Russia, if you go to Romania, if you go to Bulgaria today and the, and the eastern countries where communism has fell and the people are recovering their faith, there's a lot of evangelization going on. Tremendous work. By Orthodox or the non-Orthodox? By the Orthodox. Orthodox. Yeah. No, in, Russia, in Russia, they close the doors to the non-Orthodox, hmm. and they're trying to protect their people from them because they've, they've been trying for years to convert everybody. And in Romania, I'm not sure what's happening, but there is a lot of evangelization going on there, trying to re-evangelize their own people. Yeah. I, I'm not saying this to say that we're, not, we're doing enough. We're not doing enough. It's just that 
sometimes we misrepresent ourselves by saying that the Orthodox Church doesn't do evangelization. But he and every parish has people who are, I mean, we're converting people left and right. But, but we're, we're also, not going out there. We're also going out the door, too. Oh, we have plenty yeah. going out the door because we're not doing other things yeah. that we need to do, so that's another story. Well, he, he's that's doing a great story, though. <laughs> that's a, a great that's story. a terrific story. <laughs> And I he, would still he, like to know the problem, though. If you ever see yeah. it again, yeah. see if you can find out what it was. Now, he, he faced some, uh, some issues. What are some of the issues? Besides, his life was threatened several times, and he almost oh, died from, from robbers and so on. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not an easy place. But there is a lot of support in terms of uh, building uh, a church or uh, orphanages mm -hmm. and so on. And these things are very, very important. Uh, he... he um, uh, he faced somebody who wanted to become Orthodox and he had five wives. Mm. Now, what do you do? How do you, do you tell him, separate the four and keep only one? He said, no. He said, I had to do the catechonomian. Catechonomian is, uh, is a, a phrase saying that uh, you... Um, like on Le Yeah, yeah. accept them with the assumption that no marriages more than one wife after that. And what happened, he said, one of the children of that family who came from five wives, uh, he is becoming a brilliant student that he prepares him to go back and evangelize his people. He, he sent him to Cyprus, he spent time at the monastery, he met impeccable Greek, he translated uh, other, um, uh, um, uh, not only services, but works, uh, works of, um, of Greek um, saints and so on, into the, the native language. Hmm. And he's, uh, he, he's going to really continue the, uh, the, the tradition there. From the family of the uh, five wives. Five wives. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, we have to probably, yeah, I mean, we have a couple of Do you have any final words? Doctor? Uh, I don't have any final words. You have any final <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been talking. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for My final words is a heartfelt thank you for everything that I've experienced today. It's like a mystical experience in itself to be here. And uh, thank you, Father, what for... Is for long is tomorrow morning. morning. So you're going to be here tomorrow morning? You're gonna leave no, I'm leaving. leaving. Oh, you have to leave. Oh, it's well. a fast visit, but a very fruitful one. Well, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.